السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم His entire household, all his companions We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of them and to bless every single one of us and to grant us Jannah without reckoning. Amin. My beloved brothers and sisters, the series is entitled Save Yourself. As we said, it is taken from the verse of the Quran in Surah Al Tahreem, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your family members from the fire. Save yourselves from the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number six of Surah at tahrim So at times what happens is we become from among those who delay when it comes to obeying the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is this? We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to do certain things. We know that success lies in obeying the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, we take our time, we delay. So there are verses that we have recited of Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 67, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of an incident at the time of the Prophet Moses, may peace be upon him, Musa alayhi salatu was salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there was a murder that was committed and so they were instructed in order to find out what had happened to sacrifice a cow. Allah told the Prophet Musa alayhi salatu was salam to tell his people to sacrifice a cow. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَىٰ لِقَوْمِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تَذْبَحُوا بَقَرَةً And remember, when the Prophet Moses, may peace be upon him, told his people that Allah has instructed you to sacrifice or to slaughter a cow. It was simple for them to say, okay, here we are. We grabbed hold of the first cow and we slaughtered it. We sacrificed it. Is there anything else you want? Subhanallah. That is the condition of a true mu'min. A person who loves Allah. When Allah's instruction comes, he doesn't keep on asking so many questions. What happened at the time, they said, well, you're telling us to cut a cow. Now, what type of a cow? There are plenty cows out there. That was already a sign that they were not so keen, you know. And thereafter, they were told, okay, it should be a cow that is of this quality and that quality. They went around hunting for the cow. They found a cow. Then they said, no, hang on. What color is it supposed to be? Because now there are quite a lot of cows that fit this description. So they were told, that okay, it is a cow that is golden yellow in color and so on. And it is a cow that, you know, is very soothing to the eye when looked at. So they found several cows like that. Again, they said, well, look, you know what? We are still confused. We still want to know more details about the cow and so on. And what happened as a result? They ended up sacrificing a cow after a long, long delay. And Allah says in verse number 74, then your hearts became hardened until they were as hard as a rock or even harder. When a person delays in fulfilling the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hearts become hard. They require a jolt to soften up again. And this is why sometimes in our lives, when we are far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something snaps in our lives, something happens big. Someone dies so close to us, a health matter suddenly diagnosed with a disease that is huge. May Allah grant us all cure from diseases we have. May Allah grant cure to those who are sick and ill. And may Allah grant rahmah and mercy to those who've passed away. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it very openly, very clearly. Speaking about the hardening of the heart, when Allah softens that heart through a jolt. Remember, the true mu'min, the true believer does not wait for the day when the jolt comes to turn to Allah. Turn now. My brothers and sisters, a beautiful day from these days of Ramadan. What is making you delay? 
What is it that is making you not turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a turning point. Remember, the more you delay, the more hard your heart becomes. So hard that it becomes harder than a rock. Allah says some of the rocks, you hit them and water gushes forth. But some of the hearts, you hit them and they still don't turn to Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never make us from among those. So save yourselves from the hardening of the heart by adopting the instruction of Allah as soon as it comes to you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of another very, very stern warning. Warning regarding a problem that exists today more than ever before. The issue of black magic. I'm sure we've heard about it. If you want to save your Iman, you want to save yourself and your belief, you want to save yourselves when it comes to the wrath and the punishment of Allah and losing your Iman, then stay away from black magic. Stay away from casting spells. Let's ask ourselves, why do people do it? In this part of the world, they call them Sangomas, I think. In my country, they call them Nangas. Some places, they call them witch doctors and so on. They go to them because they want to separate people. They want to create problems. They are jealous. They want to see someone not doing well anymore. They want the business from another person. They want to steal someone else's spouse. Sometimes they go to them in order to increase the love between husband and wife. Sometimes they go to them so that the people who are doing well can no longer do well. Why? Do you know that by going to them, you have lost belief in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? من أتى عرافا أو كاهنا فصدقه بما أخبر فقد كفر بما أنزل على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. Whoever goes to a fortune teller, one of these soothsayers, one of these people who engage in this type of fortune telling and magic and so on, and he believes what has to be said by that person, the hadith says they have disbelieved in what was brought by Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. They have disbelieved in what was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Verse number 102 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ Sulaiman, may peace be upon him, was not a disbeliever. But the shayateen were disbelievers going around teaching people magic. In one narration and in one tafsir, it is reported that there were two angels, one known as Harut and the other one known as Marut. And they came down in order to test the people by teaching them something and telling them, look, this is not allowed. We want you to know that magic can happen, but it's prohibited. People can be bewitched, but if you cast a spell, you have engaged in polytheism. Man sahara faqad ashrak. I'm sure we've heard the term shirk so many times in the past. The hadith says, if you cast a spell, you have committed shirk. You have associated partners with Allah. My brothers and sisters, this is serious. Never ever go to fortune tellers or magicians or people who cast spells and participate in magic, black magic or whatever other magic it may be. It does exist. And we are taught the protection from this. Inshallah, we will see it in verses to come. But at the same time, my brothers and sisters, do not put your Iman and belief in Allah at stake. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us all. Remember, another very, very interesting point is to blame people for having done magic just because you are sick. And this is also from the devil. It is impossible for us to tell who has done what unless and until we seek the help of the devil himself. And when we do that, the devil seizes the opportunity to lead us astray. So when you go to someone, you say, look, I've got a stomach ache. I have got a headache. I've got a migraine or in some accents, they say migraine. I don't know. It might be your grain or migraine. Allah knows best. But at the same time, a migraine or whatever it is, when you go to someone and say, you know, I have this, and they tell you, yes, you are bewitched. And you say, I told you, I told you, I knew it. Why? 99% of the time, it is to do with a medical problem, a disease or a sickness that is well explained. Someone can explain it to you very easily. 
But people come and say, someone did magic on you. You say, right, I want to know who did it. Your sister-in-law. Astaghfirullah. Your mother-in-law. Your daughter-in-law. You hear the term in-law coming in. Sometimes your sister. Sometimes someone else. All this is from the devil. Don't believe it. Sort out your sickness. Don't worry about who did what. Because that is all a lie. 99.9% .9 of the times, it is a lie. Those people you are accusing are absolutely innocent. They will take away all your salah and your zakah and your hajj and your tilawah and your psalm and all the other acts of worship because you accused them. Imagine if someone had to accuse you and say, you did black magic on me and you did not do anything. You are so helpless. You just raise your hands to Allah and say, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, help me, protect me. Oh Allah. Some people don't only say, Oh Allah, help me. Oh Allah, destroy this person who's accusing me. And the hadith says, be careful of a supplication made against you by the one whom you have oppressed. For indeed, there is no hijab between that dua and Allah. There is no curtain, no barrier. That dua will be accepted when you have accused someone, when you have harmed someone. And then they say, oh Allah, destroy this person. Trust me, you will be destroyed. May Allah never do that to us. This is why rather remain silent. Stop blaming people. Learn to protect yourself by reading the surahs of protection. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a beautiful understanding. So we save ourselves from the clutches of the devil. We save our iman. We save ourselves from our acts of worship being given to other people by, a mere, by merely accusing them. It sounds light on the tongue, isn't it? You just accuse someone, hey, you did magic on me. Why are you looking at me like that? Don't worry, I'm not being serious. You can look, it's okay. But that's what people say. Look, he's looking at me. Look at the eye. The eyes are rolling. This is happening. Yes, this person, I knew it and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the devil. These are whispers of the devil. Similarly, this is the house of Allah. It is my duty and yours to realize and recognize that this house is Allah's house. Everyone is welcome here. The young, the old, the black, the white, the yellow, the green and the purple. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. I see they laughing at purple. Purple means here in Bosman someone's punched you. You still come into the masjid with a purple face. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May that never ever happen. I mean, so everyone is welcome in the masjid you are not allowed to prohibit a person from the masjid unless they are mad or they are a threat to the stability of the masjid when i say security and stability we mean they are threatening people they come in and they are harming others in the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that case you can say look those who are unwell keep them away from your masajid it's in the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam those who's, who are mentally not well at all, that they would come here and you wouldn't know where they may soil the carpet or they may say things aloud, disturbing the rest of the people. Or those who come in and threaten the others, they want to beat up this one and beat up that one. You can prohibit those from entering the masjid because they are a threat to the rest. But remember, it is wrong for us to create an environment where people who want to come to the house of Allah feel uncomfortable. They feel uncomfortable. We spoke about this on Jumu'ah. And I'm repeating it again because Allah says in verse number 114 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Who is there more oppressive than the one who prohibits the people who want to come into the house of Allah to remember Allah. They prohibit or stop or hinder the remembrance of Allah in the masajid. And they actively try to destroy the infrastructure of the masjid. When you come in the house of Allah, make sure you are not the one who litters the house of Allah. You are not the one who drops water, for example, or who dirties the wall or who messes, for example, when it comes to the toilets or the place of making wudu and so on, the place of ablution. You should not be a person who messes up that which belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You shouldn't. You should be a person who enters the house of Allah. You look after the house. If anything is wrong, you want to fix it. You want to repair it. You want to do something, obviously, with the permission of those who are in authority. You need to know that. You do not just come and do what you want. No, there has to be some form of authority. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So this is a warning. Why is this a warning? 
Because if we were to make others uncomfortable in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how would you want them to gain closeness to Allah? Allah will drive you away from His mercy when you are merciless towards others. لا يرحم الله من لا يرحم الناس Allah does not have mercy upon those who don't have mercy upon fellow human beings, upon fellow human beings. So remember this, you want the mercy of Allah, be merciful to others. You want Allah to be kind to you, be kind to others. Save yourselves from losing the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about another extremely important component when it comes to saving ourselves. Many of us, we make dua. And this evening, we're going to speak a little bit about dua. We make dua. What is dua? Supplication. We call out, Oh Allah, help me, guide me, give me. Oh Allah, I'm looking for a job. Grant me a good health. Grant me a good wife. Grant me another one and a third one and a fourth. Allahu Akbar. And so on. And we keep on making dua and dua and dua. And we ask, Oh Allah, give me, you know, uh, health and give me this and give me, Ya Allah, bless me with a good job. Ya Allah, grant me this and grant me that. Many of us forget to make dua for others. We make dua for ourselves. We are selfish. Only yourself. You want everything, isn't it? Remember, the hadith says that the angels say ameen to the dua that you are making for someone else in a way that they would say, Oh Allah, grant this person the same. So when you say, Oh Allah, give that man a million rands, and the angels say, Oh Allah, give this person also a million rands. Whose dua is better? Subhanallah. I wonder if you saw the little joke going around on WhatsApp where they say there was a man making dua. Oh Allah, my friend, Ya Allah, grant him a beautiful wife. And his wife heard the dua and slapped him across the face. So he says, why did you do that? So she says, don't think I'm a fool. I know the angels are saying, The angels are saying, give him as well. So you're asking for another wife, are you? May Allah forgive us. No, no, no. Don't misinterpret the du'as, my beloved sisters, my beloved brothers as well. Don't misinterpret other people's du'as. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. Now you know how to make the du'a, don't you? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. So in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 124, listen to one of the greatest prophets of Allah. We know the greatest, the highest, without a doubt, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thereafter, we have Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. He was also known as Khalilullah. He was also the great, great, great grandfather of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Up the ladder from the generations or from the lineage of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Do you know what he says? Allah says that we tested Ibrahim in so many ways and he passed the test. And then we told him something. And he responded in a unique way. Subhanallah. Allah says, verse number 124 of Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِذِ ابْتَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنْ And remember when Allah tested Ibrahim with a few words, with a few instructions, with some tests, and he completed them, he passed them. So Allah told him, قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِنْ Oh Ibrahim, we are making you a leader of the people. What did he say? Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Imagine if someone says, I'm making you the chairman here. Alhamdulillah, oh, I'm the chairman here. Mashallah. And so on. No. Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, when he was told, Oh Allah, when Allah told him, I am making you a leader. Do you know what he says? What about from my progeny? What will happen to them? Allahu Akbar. He says, and what about my offspring? What will happen to them? You are making me an imam, not just me. I wanted to carry on further. He was concerned about his children, my brothers and sisters. Save yourselves and your children by praying for them, by being concerned about them. A lot of us, we pray for ourselves. We don't pray for our children. Those children whom perhaps we have not yet seen, your great-great-grandchildren, those whom you may never see, pray for them. 
Oh Allah, my offspring. Oh Allah, my children. Oh Allah, bless them. Keep them steadfast on the deen up to the end of time. Oh Allah, keep them on the right path. Keep them guided. On top of that, you make sure that you are also guided in the sense that you need to be bothered about searching for the truth and following the truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all guidance and may Allah guide our children as well. This is a very, very interesting thing that we learn from Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. In fact, verse number 129 of the same surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam makes a long dua for his offspring. رَبَّنَا وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ Oh my Rabb, oh our Rabb, grant them or raise from amongst them prophets who will recite for them your verses. Oh Allah, from my offspring, I am pleading with you to raise prophets from among them, messengers from among them who will recite your verses. How many of us make dua for generations down? We might make dua for our own children. I'm talking of first generation. What about beyond that? Let's learn from Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. It's not in the Quran for no reason. Let's move on to something great. We spoke yesterday about sabr. Remember, we spoke about patience. Today, we find verses repeated again and again about patience. Because indeed it is through patience and forbearance and prayer that we will be able to achieve comfort. The soothing of the heart, the contentment of the soul will be achieved through sabr, prayer, that is patience and prayer. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, we will test all of you. We will test every single one of you with various tests. Verse number 155, Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, we will indeed test you with a bit of fear, with a bit of hunger, with loss of wealth, with loss of life and with loss in terms of produce. Your business won't do well. You cannot be healthy every day. You have to develop a sickness at some stage for you to turn to Allah, for Allah to test you. You cannot be a person who has a profit every single day. There will be days when you will suffer a loss. You cannot be a person whom every day everything is flowing smoothly. There will be days when things do not flow smoothly. Allah says, give good news to those who bear patience. Who are those who bear patience? He continues to describe them. He says, Those whom when calamity strikes them, they say, we are all belonging to Allah and we will all return to Allah. What does this mean? This means that you will save yourself from the feeling of sorrow or sadness or the, the feeling within yourself of negativity by relating things to Allah, bearing in mind where you come from and where you are going. I belong to Allah. Allah will cater for me and Allah will take me back when he is ready for me or when the time is fixed, he's going to take me back. He's going to take you back as well. So remember this, we turn to Allah at times of distress as well. And don't only turn to Allah at times of distress, but it should be a turning even at times of ease. Like the hadith says, تَعَرَّفْ إِلَى اللَّهِ فِي الرَّخَاءِ يَعْرِفْكَ فِي الشِّدَّةِ Get close to Allah. Get close to Allah during days of ease and you will, you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come close to you during the difficult days, the days when you are in hardship, Allah will come close to you. So this is something very interesting, my brothers and sisters. Allah will test us. The winner from amongst us, he or she who bears patience and who says, indeed, we belong to Allah and unto Allah is our ultimate return. Anything negative happens, have that dua on your tongues. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how to save ourselves from sickness. 
I'm talking here of physical sickness. There are many types of sicknesses, many ailments. There are many things that people go through in terms of negative health matters. But when it comes to the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, you will minimize your sickness if you were to eat that which is halal, that which is pure, that which is fit for consumption for a Muslim. It's known as halal. If you don't consume that which is halal, and if you fall into that which is haram in terms of consumption, then you will become unhealthy. You know that blood, you know pork, you know various other things, certain animals that are haram, that which is not slaughtered in the proper way, the blood has not flown out, full of disease and sickness. We are not allowed to eat that. Allah is saying, save yourself, save your health by eating that which is halal. Listen to what Allah says, verse number 168 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Ya ayyuhan nasu kunu mimma fil ardi halalan tayyiba wa la tattabi'u khutuwati shaytan innahu lakum aduwum mubin O people, eat that which is on earth that which is halal and pure. One might ask, what's the difference between the two? There are many different explanations. Halal, you and I know. But say, for example, I'm eating meat that is slaughtered properly. Everything is okay in terms of the way it was cut. But the finance or the money with which I bought that meat was actually earned in a wrong way. Then what happens? The meat might be halal, but it's not pure. It's not something clean. It's something that will result in spiritual sickness because stolen money and you went to buy beautiful halal meat from the halal butchery. For example, what happened? The meat was halal, but it wasn't pure. Your earning was filthy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us guidance. This is only one of the explanations of this term. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. He says, do not follow the paths or the footsteps of the devil. Do not follow shaitan. Do not follow the path of shaitan. For indeed, he's an outright enemy. If you want to save yourself, things will seem very, very tasty. Sometimes they will be very attractive if it is prohibited for you. Remember, it's the devil who's making it attractive. Don't fall into that trap. It will result in some form of calamity, some form of problem, some form of difficulty. This is why we need to stay away from that which earns the, the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, and we will end with this point. He speaks about the reasoning behind fasting. Fasting is supposed to protect us from so many evil things. It is supposed to give us control. Isn't it as Muslimin life as a Muslim is all about controlling yourself. It's all about subduing that which might be evil within you, putting it down. So Allah says, verse number 183 of Surah Al Baqarah. <laughs> O you who believe fasting has been prescribed upon you as it was upon those before you in order that you may achieve taqwa taqwa meaning the consciousness of Allah the fear of transgressing the command of Allah the fear of going against the instruction of the one who made us that is taqwa so we need to understand when we abstain from halal for the whole day, for the entire month of Ramadan, it should make it easy for us to stay away from haram throughout the rest of the year. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. May Allah make us from among those who can stay away from haram every single day. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with us. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.